This is the second of a two-part series looking at the history of relations between North Korea and the United States. Yesterday, we covered up to the end of the Korean War, and today we're going to pick back up from that point. As we discussed yesterday, the Korean War ended with an armistice, an agreement to end active hostilities, on the 27th of July, 1953. Despite the armistice being signed 64 years ago, there has never been a formal peace treaty, so technically, North and South Korea are still at war. In the decades since, Korea has been the site of continued conflicts and flare-ups. Both sides have attempted infiltrations and coups on the other, and their allies have not done nearly enough to ease the tensions and bring much-needed stability to the region. North Korea's invasion of the South occurred nearly 70 years ago in 1950, so we don't have time to go through every twist and turn and every up and down of that relationship between North Korea and the rest of the world. But, with your permission, a few highlights may give additional insight after the titles. Before we begin, as before, links to the various sources I've used in my research are in the description below. Okay. The war left Korea scarred and more divided than ever. Now, a narrow strip of land, just two and a half miles wide, but 160 miles long, had become the demilitarized zone, the DMZ, or DMZ if you prefer, and acted as a buffer between the North and the South. The war also left its mark on the U.S., as we talked about last time. Dwight D. Eisenhower, a former general who had served in World War II, was elected as the nation's 34th president, in part on a pledge to go to Korea personally and find an honorable way to end the war. And eventually the war did end, as previously discussed, in 1953. But peace is a very fragile thing. It must be nurtured, and neither side has done particularly well at that. In January 1958, the U.S. deployed nuclear weapons to South Korea, breaking the armistice agreement they had made just a few years earlier. Various allies expressed concern with these actions, but the U.S. proceeded. 23rd of January 1968, U.S. spy ship Pueblo was forced to pull into a North Korea port and was captured. The U.S. maintains that the ship was in international waters, while North Korea insists that it was in their territory. Either way, one crew member was killed, and the 82 surviving members were held in North Korea for 11 months until their release. In retrospect, the process of that release seems like something out of Dr. Strangelove. U.S. Major General Gilbert Woodward, chief negotiator for the U.N. on the matter, signed a statement written by the North Korean government confessing to, quote, grave acts of espionage, end quote. Even as he prepared to sign the document, literally sat down at the desk, he publicly stated that it was all bunk, and he was only signing to secure the release of the crew, which was successful. 18th of August, 1976. Nine South Koreans, two U.S. officers, and four U.S. military police ventured into the DMZ to prune a tree as was hindering the view between two checkpoints. There, they met up with North Korean troops, who allegedly initially had no objections, but then changed their mind and opposed the pruning. As with most of these incidents, the details are in disputes by the two sides. What we do know, however, is that the discussion about pruning this tree turned violent. Two of the U.S. soldiers were beaten and then murdered with their own axes. North Korea initially blamed the incident on U.S. aggression, quote-unquote, but later issued a very rare formal apology. As the PBS program Frontline commented, See the link in the description below. This incident nearly triggered the Second Korean War, or World War III, over a tree. And the tree was eventually cut down by 300 U.S. and South Korean soldiers, with air support from 26 helicopter gunships, three B-52 bombers, and a number of fighter jets. Again, all of this over a tree. In 1985, North Korea joined the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty as a non-nuclear weapon state, and then in 1992, issued a joint denuclearization statement with South Korea. The fall of the USSR in 1991 triggered celebrations in most countries, as it signaled the end of the Cold War. In North Korea, however, it just triggered insecurity. The USSR, the Soviet Union, had been pouring aid into North Korea for decades, and the country was dependent on that aid. 
food shortages, and famine set in. Some estimate that as many as 3 million more North Koreans died. During this crisis, Kim Il-sung made overtures to the West, inviting both former U.S. President Jimmy Carter and evangelist Billy Graham to the country. Both, however, declined on recommendation from the U.S. State Department. Rebuffed, North Korea instead felt the need to pursue their own nuclear weapons program to protect themselves against the perceived hostility from the West. In early 1993, evidence mounted that North Korea was indeed looking to build nuclear weapons. Then, in 1994, North Korea blocked international inspectors seeking to verify adherence to the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. The Clinton administration was absolutely convinced that North Korea was processing plutonium for bombs. Negotiations between the two sides faced numerous challenges, as neither side had much love or any trust for the other. Multiple setbacks also caused breakdowns, not the least of which was the death of Kim Il-sung on the 8th of July, 1994, which brought confusion to the process. Kim, however, was succeeded by his son, Kim Jong-il, and the negotiations gradually progressed. In October 1994, the U.S. and North Korea finally reached a pact. This agreed framework called for North Korea to halt its plutonium enrichment program, for the countries to cooperate to replace North Korea's nuclear power program with technology that could not be adapted to weapons, called a light water reactor, or LWR. The U.S. agreed to provide shipments of fuel, and both sides agreed to work towards normalization of relations between the countries. The framework was criticized, however, for lacking specifics, such as a schedule or any type of independent monitoring. The agreed framework suffered another setback when Congress switched from Democratic to Republican control, as there was substantial opposition to the framework from within that party. But early indications were good, with various steps being taken by both sides to act on the agreement. Then, in December 1994, a U.S. helicopter was shot down, with North Korea again accusing the U.S. of espionage. One pilot died, and the other was captured and held for 13 days. This reignited the distrust on both sides, and caused delays in the implementation of the framework. In 2000, while running for president, Republican George W. Bush announced his opposition to the agreed framework. After being inaugurated in 2001, his administration started a review of U.S. policy towards North Korea. And then, on the 6th of June, 2001, they announced they would indeed have a dialogue with North Korea on various issues. The LWR reactors, which had been promised in 1994, were still absent, causing complaints from North Korea. However, these were eventually shipped by a company called ABB. U.S. Secretary of Defense Donald Rumsfeld, however, was on the board of that company when it won the deal. Now, to be clear, the deal was awarded before Rumsfeld became Secretary of Defense. But it still did trigger maybe not a scandal, but at least a suggestion of insider dealing. And at least partially as a consequence of that, construction of the reactors was eventually suspended. On the 29th of January, 2002, as part of his State of the Union address, Bush referred to North Korea as one of the country's that formed the axis of evil, as part of his rhetoric to build support for his so-called war on terror. Quote, North Korea is a regime arming with missiles and weapons of mass destruction while starving its citizens, end quote. North Korean officials and those of the other countries targeted by Bush's rhetoric accused the U.S. of warmongering and moral leprosy. The rhetoric was also criticized by many foreign policy experts who expressed concerns that Bush did not see the complexity of the situation or the reactions that his words could and would trigger. In October 2002, North Korean officials finally acknowledged that yes, there was a uranium enrichment program. This program was, of course, a violation of the Non-Proliferation Treaty, the North-South Korea Denuclearization Declaration, and the agreed framework. And as a result, in November 2002, fuel shipments to North Korea suspended pending resolution of the nuclear dispute. As retaliation, in 2003, North Korea withdrew from the Non-Proliferation Treaty. This, however, did lead to the six party talks, with the U.S., North and South Korea, Japan, China, and Russia, all coming together, trying to find common ground and build consensus for a new agreement. In the end, North Korea agreed to shut down their nuclear facility in exchange for the resumption of fuel aid. Other diplomatic olive branches were also part of these discussions. While an imperfect solution, this was at least a glimmer of hope. Sadly, 
it turned into yet another missed opportunity by both sides. The bill was immediately criticized by those who argued that the Bush administration settled for too little action or evidence from North Korea. Then another ray of hope arose from a crisis on the 4th of November 2007. A North Korean vessel, the Dai Hong Dan, was attacked by Somali pirates. The North Korean crew, with U.S. Navy assistance, freed the ship. Both sides spoke favorably of the other for the first time in a very long time. Coincidentally or not, following this incident, North Korea showed a more moderate policy for a while, avoiding interference with the South Korean presidential election, and even allowing the New York Philharmonic to visit North Korea in 2008. But then in August of 2008, North Korea allegedly resumed their nuclear activities at Yongbyon. As justification, North Korea claimed that the U.S. had failed to fulfill its own promises, including not removing the country from the state sponsors of terrorists and not providing the promised aid. On the 11th of October, 2008, despite some protest and disagreement within the government, the U.S. removed North Korea from the state sponsors of terror list. But this renewed hope was again short-lived. On the 17th of March, 2009, two U.S. journalists were arrested on the border with China. North Korea claimed that they had entered the country without authorization, although this was denied by the journalists and others they were with. The two journalists were eventually set free after intervention by former President Bill Clinton. 17th of December, 2011, North Korean leader Kim Jong-il dies and is succeeded by his son, Kim Jong-un. Initially, this new leader made positive overtures towards the West. This included announcements that North Korea would freeze its nuclear tests, its long-range missile launches, and uranium enrichment. These early overtures, however, would not last. On the 16th of March, 2012, North Korea announced it would launch a satellite in celebration of the 100th anniversary of the birth of Kim Il-sung. The West, however, widely believed that the satellite launch was really just a covert way of testing early missile technology. North Korea persisted and launched the rocket on the 13th of April. However, the rocket exploded just 90 seconds after launch. This setback didn't last for long, as later in the year, on the 11th of December, North Korea did successfully manage a rocket. To the best of my knowledge, this time there was no pretense that it was anything other than a missile. On the 24th of January, 2013, North Korean officials announced a third nuclear test. This included the provocative language, quote, a nuclear test of higher level will target against the U.S. the sworn enemy of the Korean people, end quote. This test eventually takes place on the 12th of February, 2013. And then, on the 29th of March, any remaining overtures of moderation, whether they were ever real or just PR, are swept aside when Kim Jong-un claims that he has rockets that can be used to attack American bases in the Pacific. The rhetoric on both sides continues to escalate. By the end of the year, the U.S. determined that North Korea had missiles capable of striking Hawaii and would be able to strike the mainland U.S. within about three years, which has turned out to be more or less accurate. At the end of the year, on the 12th of December, there was yet another unwelcome surprise. North Korean news outlets announced that Kim Jong-un had ordered the execution of his uncle due to an alleged treason. And this is not the only such case we've seen. Earlier this year, in 2017, his brother, Kim Jong-nam, was assassinated in Malaysia. This is widely believed to have also been done on Kim Jong-un's orders. North Korea has arrested a number of foreign visitors in recent years and sentenced them to hard labor. Some of these have been released, others not. In one recent case, one of these visitors was released after he fell into a coma, but he died shortly after returning home to the U.S. On the 6th of January, 2016, North Korea conducted a fourth nuclear test. North Korean officials also claim that their scientists have miniaturized nuclear weapons to the point where they can be put into missiles. The Obama administration imposed new sanctions with nearly unanimous support in both the House and the Senate. Similar measures were considered in the UN, and there, even China, North Korea's closest ally, agreed to the sanctions and has started holding North Korea at arm's length. Unfortunately, this may just serve to fuel North Korea's perception of the world as a hostile place with no reliable allies, as we mentioned in Part 1. As of the 7th of August, North Korea has launched 18 missiles in 12 tests since February 2017. These include ICBMs capable of reaching the continental United States. Again and again over the years, we have seen opportunity after opportunity for peace and a resolution to this whole Korean situation slip away. Mistrust, fear, hate, hidden agendas, and both sides breaking their agreements. 
And we cannot blame the entire situation on those intractable Koreans. No, we in the West need to take some of that responsibility as well. Our nations and our leaders of all parties have failed to create the peace just as much as the Koreans have. And it's not just weapons tests that have ratcheted up in recent years. The North Korea propaganda machine is on high gear as well. The government of North Korea uses anti-Americanism as an ideological tool. They blame the U.S. for their situation, for their economic plight, and they create a fear of Americans in the populace, and that fear is used to unify the populace around the government. And now we reach the events of the last few weeks. The Trump administration seems, as it is on almost every issue, at odds with itself on the issue of North Korea. At the very least, the administration is sending mixed messages, with some officials trying to diffuse the tension, step back from the precipice, and minimize fears of yet another war, only to be undercut by unhinged and unspecific statements and tweets from Trump, warning North Korea to be very, very nervous, that they will be in trouble like few nations have ever been, threatening fire and fury, and now that the U.S. is locked and loaded. This dangerous rhetoric only serves to heighten decades-old tensions move us closer to the precipice and to war. This is the language and belligerence of the schoolyard bully, not the alleged leader of the free world or the leader of the most powerful country on the planet. Trump is strengthening the anti-American narrative in North Korea and playing right into their hands. At a time when the U.S. and the world needs a cool head and steady hands, we instead have a president who has neither the intellectual rigor nor the attention span to understand this very complex situation, or the patience and wisdom to consider his words. And so he blunders around the world stage, making it worse at every turn. Please share your thoughts, feedback, opinions, and where needed corrections in the comments below. As always, if you'd like to see more content like this, please like, subscribe, and share the video. Thank you, and be good. And if you can't be good, be wicked well.